Hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages as they arrive. And in the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the broadcaster and former MP, Anna Subri, and the political editor of The Sun, Harry Cole. Thank you both so much for joining us. Looking forward to going through your choices in a moment. Uh, let's see what is on the front of some of those papers. The US President, Joe Biden, has joined both the UK and Irish Prime Ministers in calling for calm in Northern Ireland following a week of violence. The situation in Belfast is the main picture for the Metro, but the front page is also dedicated to the staff at pubs, restaurants and shops in England who are working around the clock to get ready to reopen in three days' time. Keep taking the AstraZeneca vaccine, the plea on the front of the eye over blood clot concerns linked to the jab. While The Times reports that the majority of Britons trust the Oxford vaccine, according to a poll by the newspaper. The Telegraph says holidaymakers will have to pay hundreds of pounds for COVID tests if they want to go abroad. But the Mail says travellers will get free test kits before they jet off on foreign travel, which could start as early as next month. The Yorkshire Post leads on the impact that the pandemic has had on children's mental health. The FT reports that President Biden's administration is calling for the world's biggest companies to pay levies to national governments based on their sales. Well, as I said, we are joined tonight by Anna Subri and Harry Cole. Uh, lots and lots for us to, to get through. Uh, we'll start with the situation in Belfast. Uh, you've picked out the Metro uh, as your first paper. Anna, their, their, their front page, the bad old days are back with the headline, the glorious 12th below it, possibly a, li a little ill-advised. Yes, I, I know the reference to which you uh, are making, but uh, I, I, look, let's concentrate on Northern Ireland, if, if, if we can, about what's actually happening at the moment and why it's so important. Um, and and it, it has to be noted that if you look at which papers have actually even got Northern Ireland on the front page, it's the Metro, it's the Guardian, but there's no mention in the Times, there's no mention... Um, in the Telegraph either. They don't want to talk about it now. I think there's a, there's a very clear reason why they don't, and that is because these disturbances are largely linked to the dreadful Brexit deal and the consequences of Brexit, uh, and they don't want to talk about that at all. But the Metro, to its credit, is at least um, saying that this is a story that we should be talking about, and, of course, there is this real fear that we are indeed going back to the days which I'm certainly old enough to remember and these dreadful outbreaks of sectarian uh, violence. I mean, these shots which you have uh, are, are taken where there are attacks on the police. It started uh, in the so-called unionist uh, communities or parts of them, uh, but it is not going away. And this story will not go away, however much uh, people who are keen supporters of Brexit might want it to. It is also, this is the beginning of the breakup of the UK, in my opinion. It is also on the front of the, of the Financial Times, um, London yeah. and Dublin appealing for calm. And, of course, we know that their words uh, have been joined by, by Joe Biden's as well uh, in the last couple of hours. I mean, Harry, uh, th the message coming from some people in Northern Ireland, it seems to be that the UK government didn't listen to, to unionist concerns. Do you, do you think that that is a... A fair point for them to make. I mean, yeah, how they are making it is, is is a different matter, isn't it? Absolutely, there is obviously there is obviously been very increasingly vocalised complaints that the unionists are not being listened to. They're being increasingly silent. Now, this isn't a justification for violence. This isn't, and as every every side has said on a political level, stop. This isn't the answer. Um, however, there is a growing feeling within the unionist community that they are being cut out, they are being sidelined, they're being... And that has, goes back to before the Brexit process, but the Brexit process has really brought that to the surface. And it's not just Brexit, despite the um, opponents of, the, of, the, of what's happened over the last five years in this country would love it to all be about Brexit. There are other factors. The trigger for this really has been, has been the um, appalling scenes we saw at an IRA funeral that saw frontline politicians, uh, uh, their, their friends in, in, in politics, turn out despite thumbing their nose at every COVID regulation going and then getting away scot-free. That, uh, has added to the sense within the unionist community that they are being ignored, they're being shunned, and there's one rule for for them and one rule for others. So it is. It has come to a, to, to a boiling point. On the bigger picture about Brexit, I, 
I think you know what do what do those people and I'm not necessarily including Anna in this but what do those people want who say that this is all because of Brexit are they saying that they that Brexit should have been stopped that the referendum should have been overturned and you know the will of the people should have been ignored because I think they need to listen to, to how that what they actually mean by when they say that because you're seeing violence on the street here that some people want to pin on Brexit but you would have seen similar scenes across the country, I think, had the uh, had the, the referendum result been ignored as some wished. Do you think that's a fair point to make, Anna, that, that we'd have seen rioting on you know, the streets of Wolverhampton over Brexit no. in the same way? <laughs> no, no, no. The, the, the problem is, is that we never understood... Forgive me, we did not debate and understand the consequences of Brexit on Northern Ireland and what it would mean. And whichever way you cut it, unless you had membership of the single market and the customs union, then you were going to have to put a border effectively um, in, in, in the Irish Sea. And that is what has happened, because it was the only way that you could deliver Brexit. And that obviously is going to have profound consequences, because effectively we are dis disjointing our United Kingdom. And whether people like it or not, it means that the calls for uh, the Northern Ireland to be united, as, as many would call it, uh, with the Republic are growing. And the danger is, is that if there's a border poll, then we will get into that territory of people wanting to join the, uh, with the Republic. And so the, the sort of conversation we need to have is to say what is in our countries, in the United Kingdom's best interest. And I think we come back yet again, and it's an old argument I accept, because we've left the European Union. It's not about rejoining. It's about getting that single market and that customs union, which would ensure that that situation in Northern Ireland is, is, is effectively eradicated. And as it happens, it would be very much in the interests of the entire economy for the United Kingdom. Harry, um, we, we, we know the Northern Ireland Secretary is, is obviously in, intervening and, and getting involved, but do you think that this should go higher up? Do you think this, that, that, you know, Boris Johnson should be across there, should be sorting this out? Not sure, to be honest, quite what the Prime Minister going to Northern Ireland to, tomorrow is going to do uh, to, to, to alleviate tensions, in, in all honesty. I think the last thing people want is a load of day-trippers turning up to uh, to gulp. Um, there are better ways of dealing with that. I'm, I'm going to resist the temptation, because we'll be here all night, to pile in on to, to Anna's, uh, Anna's argument there that we should reopen the last five years of um, of, of debates about the, about the entire UK's membership of the Customs Union and the single market, only to say that you know there was a degree of inflexibility and intransience by the EU who who, who wanted to were perfectly willing to use the, the, the situation in, on the island of Ireland and Northern Ireland itself as a bit of a, a bit of a pawn uh, in the negotiations and and that is coming home to roost. Um, how that it, but in in the short term, I agree with Anna though that, that you know it, it isn't about re fighting the fighting the old battles. There does need to be a solution to this. This isn't going to go away. The unionists. Uh, you know, are adamant that their place in the union is, is, is you know, is is being undermined by this protocol. And without a return to that particular issue, I don't really see how this does dissipate without broadly a large part of the Brexit deal being fundamentally ignored. Um, okay. However, I do, I, you know, I'm not sure what Boris Johnson turning up would do, but I do, uh, I do, do slightly agree that, that you know we we should be paying a bit more attention to to this situation than we currently are. Well, you talked about the EU being intransigent. Uh, despite that, lots of people would still want to go there for their summer holidays if they possibly could. Which brings us <laughs> on to the story <laughs> on the front of the, the Telegraph <laughs> and, and also the Mail, um, the Daily Telegraph, saying talk about the backlash over the cost of these tests for for holidays. Uh, we spoke to Isabel Oakshaw earlier in the week on the pay per view, and she was saying that she'd paid out. Not not far short of a, a one and a half thousand pounds for tests for her and her children to go away. It does seem extraordinarily expensive. The Telegraph says there's a backlash over the cost. The Mail is saying that they are going to be uh, possibly free. Wh which which is the it's truth? It's, they're both true, is, is, <laughs> is the reality of this. Now, the big debate about these traffic lights is in green zone countries, 
Um, you will require a test to get on the plane before you come back into England. Now, it looks like they are going to be the free PCR test, sorry, the free lateral flow, flow test that the government are rolling out for everyone to be able to have a couple of times a week. Now, you'll be able to pack those in your suitcase and before you fly back into the UK, you will be, you'll be able to take a free test. Now, where the expense is going to come is, the, the, is taking a PCR test three days after you've returned to the UK. Now, this is crucial in the eyes of the Department of Health. Matt Hancock's been pushing this particularly of, let's not knock the, the vaccine rollout over. The worst thing that could happen now is we vaccinate everyone, we get to July and everyone's been offered their first jab, and then a variant of concern comes along that the, the vaccine doesn't, uh, that isn't as effective against, and set us back to square one and we're back to you know the virus ripping through the community now a pcr test would be able to spot new variants even if it's in a green zone country where the prevalence of the coronavirus isn't that that high you could still bring back a variant so the the sort of deal that seems to be done here is you know the the the, the treasury and and travel department and the tra uh, transport department have been pushing for tourism to be given the, the green light for for people to be able to travel to people to be able to come here cr crucially yeah. as well for holidays now the, the deal seems to be done that yes you can come here but you've got to fork out for that quite expensive yeah. pcr test and, on the second day so there is no to getting away from the fact holidays yeah. are going to be more expensive and very briefly I mean, do you think it's enough to, to, to have a lot of the lateral flow tests or do you think we, we really should be still doing the PCR tests? No, the PCR test is the, is the better of the, of the two tests. Mm. But I think the reality is, is that there aren't going to be that many countries on that green light in any event. Um, and it, yeah, I think they're, they're probably going to be some EU countries. Um, and that they might include the Maldives, but, you know, the vast majority of people when they go on the holidays don't go off to the Maldives. They go to France, they go to Greece, they go to Portugal, they go to Spain, they go to Italy. So uh, those are the sorts of countries which are going to be interesting to see uh, where we are in the summer. But, yeah, crikey, people need a summer break and they need often to go to the guaranteed sunshine. Yeah, and, it, and it, we shouldn't forget, of course, it's not just people going on holiday, but also people visiting family as well. Um, Thank you both very much. Uh, yeah. Lots more to come from you in the second half, uh, including the crime that's risen by a fifth. The government announces a new task force to combat dog napping. Stay tuned. It actually, uh, my experience was in to August 2019. I, uh, I, I was on the business trip for the British consulate generals in Hong Kong, in Shenzhen. But when I've been back uh, in Hong Kong physically in Wax Kowloon, which is in central Hong Kong, I've been stopped and delivered back to Shenzhen. I've been interrogated for political reason. I've been suspected as like a person to instigate the protest back in Hong Kong. So I've been interrogated by the National Security Police that time. But I have been very lucky uh, because that's I've been released afterwards. On the estimated numbers of the Home Office, it could be about 300,000 uh, BNO citizens with their dependents to come to the UK over five years. But when we see the rates of the applications now, um, actually it would far exceed that the estimated numbers of the Home Office, which is a good thing because it's quite attractive uh, to uh, Hong Kong people who wanted to flee from the tyranny. So I believe that as quite many Hong Kongers, they are losing hope to achieve democracy and then they definitely wanted to fight a haven. But so far at this moment still, that they need to apply it online or that's through the website for the BNO uh, visa. And then they need not to have valid BNO passport. They come here as provided they have a BNO status and then they can they can apply the BNO visa. So far, we're very appreciate and grateful for the UK government um, because that's they provide very comprehensive and powerful support package for Hong Kongers to uh, resettle in the UK. Um, although we haven't uh, uh, know about more details how to apply for that fund, but. As uh, founders of the Hong Kongers in Britain, one of the uh, civil society organisations to provide the support uh, to Hong Kongers, um, I think definitely in the future uh, will be in the loop uh, to understand that how we can proceed concretely.
but definitely that would be a very great news for most of the Hong Kongers, especially that's a B&O citizens. For the early risers. As we examine the story beyond the headline. For the knowledge seekers. Welcome to Divided States. For the straight talkers, the curious, and the ones who want to be entertained. Backstage, Sky News' entertainment podcast. For wherever you are. Welcome to the Safety Ridge on Sunday podcast. For the ones who want to know more. Welcome to the All Out Politics podcast. For the listeners. From Sky News Storycast. Sky News Podcasts. Listen and subscribe for free. Welcome back. You're watching The Press Preview with me now, the broadcaster and former MP, Anna Subri, and the political editor of The Sun, Harry Cole. Um, and th the story that we're starting this half with is uh, Rishi Sunak and David Cameron's texts. Anna, the, the Telegraph has that on the front. Uh, Sunak pushed Cameron bank request. We've had the, the release of, of Sunak's replies to texts from David Cameron under a Freedom of Information uh, request, but we don't know what David Cameron said in the first place. Do you think... David Cameron should just really come clean now, release all the texts and get it all out in the open? Well, I think it's actually more what Rishi Sunak's done, which is that he has published what was on his private mobile phone, the texts bag, which is, well, we've, I've asked my officials to have a look at it and we've, we've had a look at it and there's nothing we can do about it. And I know how this looks, but I'm just trying to take a little step back and think, you get a request from somebody, uh, and it happens to be the former prime minister, saying, look, could you have a look at the rules relating to something, which I'm sure he you know, was upfront about the fact that he was involved in it, um, and see whether or not it might be that they could be in some way changed because they're not helping uh, a British business. And I, I saw a, a comment from a member of parliament that was, well, you know, I've got businesses in my patch that would like that sort of access. Well, actually, they do have that sort of access because they have a member of parliament who can make those requests to Rishi Sunak or anybody else at the But treasury. isn't the point not, not whether or not he should have sent the text? I think it reflects but... badly on camera. Yes, and, and That's should, the therefore, point. he That's now the point. just release his text? He's been very quiet about it. Well, I don't... I, I mean, he's, he is a private citizen... Frankly, I am very disappointed in him because, you know, you, it, it just it looks a bit grubby, doesn't it? And it's a bit, you know, how many more ministers can I go begging almost to say, guys, can you help me out here, please? Yeah. Um, it looks bad and it, it looks demeaning of a prime minister. Mm. Harry, briefly, your thoughts before we move on yeah, to dog napping? I think the whole thing's a bit a bit sad, really. He's sitting in his in his um, in his shepherd's hut you know, firing off texts as if he was still sort of relevant. And clearly, they didn't get him very far, which is the, the sort of um, humiliating bit of it. I think pigs will fly before we, he, he comes uh, out and, and uh, releases his text, because I imagine the Treasury has spared his blushes a bit here. I bet they are excruciatingly cringeworthy mm -hmm. and would look bad. Um, but I think the precedent here is really interesting. Rishi Sunak wouldn't be, wouldn't be offering these up before, the, before all the deadlines on FOI and various things like that mm -hmm. if he thought he'd even was in trouble here but the precedent is fascinating now it's brilliant for journalists um we can okay. be happier about this and the fact that private phones of ministers are now in play under foi okay. and there's no well listen we're, we're gonna have to leave it there because we're out of time